before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. This is just uh, hopefully going to be a quick little video. As you guys know, or maybe you know, currently, right now, today is April the 10th, 2024. So we have in the United States right now, we've got the Chad Daybell tri trial that is starting apparently on Wednesday, April 10th, today. They are doing their opening statements. They selected the jury on Monday, and then I believe they had Tuesday off, which makes a lot of sense. If you're not familiar with this case, this is the case of, basically there were two defendants, uh, Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell, and they ended up unaliving, alleged, well, Lori Vallow has already been found guilty. So we can say yes for sure, but for Chad, in the United States, everybody is presumed innocent until proven guilty. It's the state, it's the prosecutor's job. They they bear the burden of proof to prove that Chad Daybell did, in fact, participate in the unaliving of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell, Chad's first wife. In my opinion, he is extremely guilty. This is a capital punishment case. So we've got this, the stakes are really high. Lori Vallow's case was not capital punishment due to, um, I think, a technicality. And so the stakes are really high. The, the case is being tried over in Idaho. Now, I'm super fascinated in this case because this case, in my opinion, really stems from a huge, huge delusional and magical thinking. And as you guys know, as I stated last week and with Shanti on Shanti show, which I'm going to put the links to that because we're going to talk about this live at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I think this is a really important um, case for anybody who's in the disclosure community or the truth or community to look at because I see a lot of ca commonality with Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, their delusions and a lot of the delusions that are on Telegram today. And delusions are well and great. And, you know, a lot of people create this alternate reality in their mind. As long as you're not hurting anybody, whatever, no harm, no foul. But in a lot of cases, it goes overboard and people lose their lives. And in this case, two children were among the victims. Now, there are four victims. I just want to go ahead and get this out of the way because I know I have a lot of people from other countries watching. Once again, in the American judicial system, we have federal court, but we also have state courts. So if somebody, wherever you commit a crime, that's the county and the state that you will be charged with the crime in. So yes, we do have at this point that we are aware of four victims. We have Tammy Daybell, Chad Daybell's first wife, we have Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. They were all unalived in the same county. So the case that we have in Idaho with Chad Daybell is involving these three victims. Lori Vallow has already been found guilty of these three victims. And I've seen a lot of these news YouTube stations or people from other countries are getting really, really mad because the news reporter isn't talking about Charles Vallow, the fourth victim. Y'all, there's a reason for that. In the court case that's happening right now, Charles Vallow is not a victim in this court case because he was unalived in Arizona. Again, the United States, I understand like in Europe, the countries are really small. So things are done very differently. 
Um, but like Australia, like Canada, we're big Russia, we're big countries. Like United States has continental United States has four time zones. That's not even including Alaska or Hawaii, which are not considered continental United States, but still under, they're still American, right? If you add those in, we've got multiple, like six or seven different time zones. If we're a huge country, huge. So the only people that can still the jury are people that are from the county where the crime was committed. I mean, there are a lot of different laws around this. And so Chad, or excuse me, Charles Vallow was unalived in Arizona. Now, Lori Vallow has been charged in his unaliving, but she has not gone to trial yet. So she is due to stand trial for his unaliving. But at this point, again, the United States, everybody is innocent until proven guilty but Lori has been found guilty for Tylee JJ and Tammy now Chad is facing those charges I don't think that Chad will will be charged for um for Charles I don't think he was anywhere near the situation we'll see what what unfolds after but but nonetheless what Chad Daybell is facing now is a capital punishment case so his life is literally on the line and the jury was selected on Monday now from what I understand the judge in this case in Idaho Idaho it is a quicker flight for me to fly to London England than it is for me to fly to Idaho that's how far Idaho is from me even though I'm in the same country but Idaho it's behind me in time what the judge in this case has to, because it's a, such a high profile case, the jury needs to remain anonymous. So the judge has allowed, I believe, I believe the judge has allowed cameras in the courtroom, but the jury cannot be filmed. This is for the jury's safety. So I think there are 18 jurors selected, 12 are actual jurors, and I think six are what they call alternates in case something happens to one of the 12. Now, the six alternates, if all 12 make it to the end of the case, the six alternates will not be deliberating, but they will have to be present for all of the, the trial and take notes, just like the jury, in case one of the jurors, something happens, they're compromised, gets sick, whatever. So with the jurors, I my heart like goes out to the jurors because this is such a hope a high profile case. Anytime you serve serve on a jury, and I I love jury duty, I love it. But anytime you serve on a jury, you're you have to stay away from everything. You can't talk to anybody. You can't talk. I mean, even in the case that I served. In LA, I couldn't even talk to my fe fellow jury men and women until we deliberated, right? So you can't even talk to the people you're on the jury with. And with a case like this, you have to stay. Now, the case that the, the times I've served jury duty, it hasn't been vi big cases. Like there's been no media coverage. So I was pretty safe. But with a big case like this, the jury cannot watch any media coverage. They cannot talk to anybody about the case. When they go home at night, they can't talk to their spouses, their friends. They have to be very, very much keep everything to themselves until deliberation. If by chance they, they slip up and they watch a YouTube channel or they watch the media, they have to report it to the judge and they have to be dismissed from the jury. Now, a lot of people are like, how do you keep people from doing that? Actually, in my experience, most Americans take this very seriously. In my experience, in the juries that I have served on, most American people understand that they cannot be influenced by any outside sources, that they have to get all their information from the courtroom. Now, because, again, this case is such a big deal, from what I understand, all of the jurors have to meet at a certain location before court at a certain time, get into a van together where a bailiff, and a bailiff is basically just like a court cop, and they probably are going to have a couple of them, will drive them to the courthouse so they can be escorted into the court together. Now, for me, I don't think this has anything to do with any news reporters trying to talk to them or any people trying to talk to them. I think this is for their safety. And the reason why I say this is most news reporters who cover true crime very much know the law and they know that they cannot approach the jury. They cannot approach people who are ba basically the jury is the, the people that are going to decide the fate of this man. Right. They know that. And I think most, most reporters, like I was listening to a reporter say today on his YouTube channel that 
if he were to even go into a convenience store on a break and see one of the jurors in there, he would probably turn around and leave because he doesn't want to compromise that juror in any way, shape or form. And also for some of these reporters who work for big media companies, I personally would be afraid of, of being held in contempt of court because I think the judge probably looks at these reporters, especially the ones who have been doing it for a very long time. They know the rules. They know they're not supposed to approach the jury during the case. Now, after the case is over, all's fair. But um, and so I think a lot of the reporters could potentially be held in contempt of court if they try to approach the jury. But again, the reason why I think they're being escorted by the bailiff, this is just strictly my opinion, is because of safety. Because this is such a tumultuous. We're, we're talking about two children, right? And so I think they just, I know, I believe that it was Lori, when Lori Vallow's case was going on, she herself had to go to court every day with a bullet, bullet best on you know like this is a this is a serious people's emotions are high you know and i do think they gave tuesday off my opinion that they gave tuesday off for the jurors they have a day off in order to go sort out their affairs at home to make sure that they had this this trial could last anywhere from eight to ten weeks so they had to make sure they had um help for their children that they had everything worked out because they were going to be in the courtroom. And when you're in the courtroom, you don't have your cell phones. The cell phones typically are confisc confiscated, especially for the juror, the jury. So they have to make sure everything's set up at home. Now, as far as sequestering, I, I would be curious to see if they make it the whole case without being sequestered. And what is sequestering? So sequestering means that they, they force the jury, they take the jury and they put them in a hotel together. So they are watched. So they can't, you know, make sure they're not watching any news stations. I do know that from what I heard from another reporter, that if they do find Chad Daybell guilty and they have to go now deliberate the punishment. So again, capital punishment is on the table. So they have to go and decide amongst the jury whether he lives or whether he dies. Life imprisonment or capital punishment. And I believe that if that's the case, if they find him guilty, that they will be sequestered while they talk because it's such a serious serious um punishment right that's from what i understand now but with that being said we are on aquarius rising africa today i think it's very kind of serendipitous that this case this court case started while we were going over the um we started with Ruby, Frankie, and Jody Hildebrandt, and it was like, let's just talk about Lori Vallow, too. And then I had no idea Chad's Daybell's case was going to be starting during this time. But we are going to, as we kind of talk about this case, Shanti and I are actually going to start to break down Mormonism. And I want to make this very, 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 very clear. I think Christianity is not good. I think a lot of religions are not good. So I want to make it very, very clear that if you are a Mormon, all the Mormons I've ever known in my whole entire life have been incredible people. I'm not talking about you. I do understand that people are grandfathered into their faiths. But what I want to look at is some of the delusions. And this is, again, is why, why I also think it's very important people study the law of one. So they understand negative polarity and positive polarity. When we talk about Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, we are going to be talking about what the Cassiopeians have to say about him. And it's not good. It is not good. So when you are working, so there's the Book of Mormon. So I, th I don't even think Shanti was aware of this. So we have the Bible. And then the Mormons also have a, a second book. Well, they have, they have the doctrine and all these other things too. But let's just talk right now about these, the, the Book of Mormon. Now, in my opinion, I've read the Book of Mormon. I read the Book, book of Mormon just for shits and giggles. I just want to know what it said. Wasn't ever going to uh, to become a Mormon. And I believe it's a load of crap. I think it is. There's a lot of reasons, academic reasons why. The way Joseph Smith translated the Book of, Book of Mormon, it just so happened to be translated into the same uh, King James English as the King James Bible, which if these were gold plates from however many, however many centuries ago, it would not be in King James English. Common sense, right? But basically, the Book of Mormon talks about this Jewish family, Lehi, who gets this revelation from God to basically leave Jerusalem before it falls to the Babylonians and get on a boat and lo and behold, they find America and that these are the, the ancestors of the native Americans. And so he has these sons, he has Nephi and 
you know, anyway, it just breaks off to like Lamanites, the Lamanites, the, the Jesus after he comes, he like resurrects and then comes over to America and tells everybody in America, hey, I'm the son of God. And I was just like killed over. And, you know, anyway, and then all of a sudden, boom, here comes the, the colonist. It's very racist. The Book of Mormon, they talk about like white skin being white and delightsome. It's, it, we'll get into the, all of that with um, with shanti but i wanted to kind of talk about something i'm actually getting this from the lds website in the very beginning of the book of mormon we're hit with a story of nephi one of the main characters one the, the youngest son of lehi nephi nephi is like the the godliest of sons right and he has to go and get some like plates from one of the the authority figures of the area before they can even get on a boat and go to America. So they're still in like the Jerusalem area. And God tells Nephi to basically unalive this man, Laban, this man, decapitate him in order to take these plates. Like God tells him to unalive somebody. Now, again, I think the book of Mormon is pure fiction pure fiction always have thought it was pure fiction from the moment i read him i read it i was like this ain't nothing but this ain't nothing but fantasy you know this is not legit but when we look but if you're taking this story as accurate as something that's literally part of your doctrine we, if we look at things like the law of one i'm going to pull up the lds website here you guys when we look at things like the law of one the light the only time it is ever acceptable to unalive a human being or an animal, according to the positive side of God, is if your life is being threatened, and that's your self-defense, or the person or the animal is in misery, it needs to be put out of its misery. If there's an entity telling you to unalive someone, especially if because the, the person he unalives, Laban, is drunk. Like, passed out drunk. It's not threatening Nephi. So if you've got a voice telling you to unalive someone, it ain't God. It ain't God. And the Cassiopeians have a lot to say with that. They talk about, if I remember correctly, which we'll get to that when we talk more about Joseph Smith, that little narcissistic psychopath, in my opinion. Um, we'll talk about his influence from the reptilians that the Cassiopeians speak about. So this is directly from the Book of Mormon. First Nephi, which is the first book of the Book of Mormon, three. So it's like right, boom, right smack in the beginning of the Book of Mormon, you're hit with this story. All right. So what appears to be a breaking of a commandment is actually an example of God's great mercy. This is gaslighting. This is word salad. This is actually, this is actually narcissistic abuse. This is a prime example of confusing people. So we know that there's a commandment not, not to unalive. Do not unalive someone. They're going to actually, but this is God's mercy because this dude, Nephi, chopped the head off of someone who was drunk and passed out. For some people, especially those new to the Book of Mormon, and most challenging or unsettling story is Nephi's slaying of Laban. Couldn't Nephi have just taken Laban's clothes, retrieved the plates, and then left with Zoram? Nephi chose to include the story. And the many times I have studied and taught this account, I have pondered why Nephi included it. Surely he understood how hard this would be for others to understand. Couldn't he have skipped the, de the difficult detail about unaliving Laban and just said that, the that by the power of God, he and his brothers were eventually able to get the plates from him? The point is he did not. Nephi felt impressed by the spirit to write detailed accounts of how he obtained the brass plates it's important to know that when nephi began this record he wrote with hindsight he had more than 30 years to ponder the encounter with laban and its importance became even more significant to him he saw clearly what the lord had done for him and his family for him and why in one nephi one with a perfect perspective of where he was leading his readers nephi explained a major theme of what he was about to write but behold i nephi will show unto you the tender mercies of the lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance well here we go too this is also a good sign of a negative polarity all those whom he hath chosen that's elitism. That's a pecking order. 
that's a huge red flag. So this whole story from the beginning of the Book of, Nor of Mormon, we have red flags for a negative, satanic, polarized religion. Ultimately, the particular deliverance I am focusing on was not merely the plates or Nephi's life, nor was it the deliverance of, of the Nephite nation alone. Instead, the outcome was something much greater. It was intended to assist in the deliverance of all mankind. Anyway, I'm going to include a link to this down in the description box below, but we're going to talk a lot about this. I don't want to go too, 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 too deep into it because we're going to get to it with Shanti. But the reason why I bring this up now when speaking about Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, who were practicing Mormons, we're talking about a faith where there is such thing as blood atonement, where there is such thing as almost like an honor killing, right? And we see that right at the beginning of the Book of Mormon. And we know that Chad Daybell, allegedly, we don't know that because he's innocent until proven guilty, but we can definitely say for Lori Vallow because she was, she was found guilty, that they rated people as being dark or light souls. And the ones that were too far gone dark, they called zombies. And they felt like they had the right, the God-given right to unalive these people two of whom happen to be Lori's juvenile children. And we see in some of the talks that Lori references this story. This story gives her an okay to act out on her narcissistic tendencies, psychotic tendencies, right? Now, again, I know most Mormons are never going to hurt anybody. Like, I get that. This is an extreme case. But we have to take it back to the beginning because their delusions come directly from Mormonism. And a lot of their delusions, a lot of the people out there who are in the disclosure community, in the truther community, are following a lot of the same delusions. In fact, one thing that Chad used, allegedly used, to determine if someone was good or bad, or to determine who some what who somebody was in a past life, because they also believed in past life reincarnation, which is something that um, is not taught, from my, my understanding, in mainstream Mormonism. Oh, my pendulum stuck to one of my bracelets here, guys. Um, here we go. One thing he would use is a pendulum. How many people on Telegram are using pendulums to ask if somebody is good or bad? Pen that's abusing. That is abusing tools of divination. A pendulum is only supposed to be used for you. That's it. And it's supposed to be used for basic questions that you have no emotional attachments to. Like, do I need more vitamin C in my diet? Should I go to the grocery store on Tuesday or Wednesday. When's a good day for me to do laundry? Like stuff. That's what this is for because it's it's read it's not reading anybody else's energy but yours. It's reading your energy. So if you are a sex obsessed woman who needs to get her kids out of the way so that you can run off with this man that you think is your god and you're his goddess and that Jesus loves you more and you're going to be part of the the rapture but you got these kids then of course this pendulum is going to tell you they're zombies and give you a reason to remove them if you cannot use pendulums in the way that they're supposed to be used which is strictly for you then you you should have your pendulum taken away from you if you are following anybody that uses a pendulum in order to to tell you the value of a, another human being's soul, then you are following a delusional narcissist. A pendulum cannot tell you the value of somebody else's soul. A pendulum cannot tell you whether somebody is a dark soul or not. If you don't like somebody, put a boundary up. But you don't get to rate them as dark or light. And if you are doing that, have fun in hell because that's a negative polarity. If you're following somebody who does that, you might want to rethink who you're following. Look at the Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow Daybell case. Does it remind you of people on Telegram? Yes, it does. And hope to God that none of these Telegram groups that are doing the exact same thing and the disclosure and truth or community that Lori and Chad are doing, I hope to God it does not lead to unaliving people.
All right. So that is why it's super important that we speak about this case. Um, I'm still horrified every time I see the pictures of Tylee and JJ. It just breaks my heart. Um, in my opinion, Laurie Vallow deserves to rot in hell. Her children were beautiful. And I cannot believe that she put a man over the safety of her own children. That is not, ironically enough, that is not something a spirit of the light like she thinks she's this ultra spirit of a goddess, which we'll talk about that. Gods and goddesses, plural, are big in Mormonism. They all think they're going to get their own planet one day. Yep. We'll talk about that with Shanti. And again, I have many friends who are Mormon. And if you're, I'm not, I'm just talking about the manipulation of the LDS church and the powers that be, starting with Joseph Smith. We're going to talk about Joseph Smith because what a scumbag he was. He was not a prophet. Listen, if you're in any religion, Christianity included, that has prophets, you're in a negatively polarized religion. Negatively polarized. Only, only on the negative side are there special people who can talk to God. On the positive side, we're all prophets. We all talk to God. Okay? So anyway, please make sure you join us on a uh, excuse me, Solutions with Shanti, the second channel. Solutions with, with Shanti at 12 p.m. Eastern Time today on Wednesday as in every Wednesday we're going to finish talking about the actual case, like what happened, the timeline that we know of with Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And then as we progress through the trial, every week we'll have updates on what is going on in the trial. Hopefully, um, hopefully Chad Daybell will be found guilty. I, um, I'm assuming he will be because there's just overwhelming evidence. But they have, the prosecution has said that there will be new evidence with the Chad trial. So it'll be interesting to see um see what comes up i do know that Lori's one of Lori's brothers a guy named adam cox and um her uncle Lori's uncle have a who support the jury support the punishment they they, they know that their sister and their niece did horrific things they have a podcast called i think it's called tylee and or jj and tylee silver silver linings or silver silver linings jj and, i'll put a link to it down in the description box below and they if you want to know more about this this case again hidden true crime is doing a lot they have a i just really enjoyed they, they really dedicated a lot of work to getting to know the players in this case and talking about the cult following around this case julie rowe all these people that are involved in this delusional psychotic world um, prepper world, which again rings a bell with the truther and disclosure community, doesn't it, guys? So we're gonna go into way more detail over with Shanti, but I wanted to give you guys a heads up. So please join us at noon. If you can't join us at noon, you can go, always go back and watch the replay. But if you join us at noon, you can join in with us on the live and put your opinion and add your opinion and your thoughts on this case. Would love to talk to more Mormons about this or anybody who knows the family. Um, rest in peace to Tammy Daybell. Rest in peace, JJ Vallow. Rest in peace, Tylee Ryan, and rest in peace, Charles Vallow. These were four lives that shh, were gone way too soon, all for all because of all because of a damn pendulum and a religion, in my opinion, that was founded on pure delusion. All right, you guys, we'll see you over on Solutions with Shanti.